Hello, good morning, uh, everybody here in, in the room and online. Thank you very much for coming here to this uh, new Severo Ochoa Colloquium. Uh, today, the speaker is uh, Raúl Carvalho Rubio. And Raúl was, uh, was here already several years ago at the IAA, making his PhD thesis under the supervision of uh, Carlos Barceló, who's there. And, um, and of course, as all the, the thesis here, uh, defended at the University of, of Granada. Since then, uh, he has been a postdoctoral researcher in, in four institutions in different countries with a number of, of collaborators. He's very active and a very promising uh, researcher in, in this field. He's an expert on black hole uh, physics with a particular emphasis on the study of, uh, I have to read it, microstructure and its possible imprints at macroscopic scales. And since uh, 2021, he's participating in the international pro uh, program project called the New Generation Event Horizon Telescope that uh, you are all, I'm sure, aware of. Specific specifically, uh, he's a member of the Fundamental uh, Physics Science uh, Working Group. And within this group, he is co-leading the topic of quantifying horizon physics. And uh, he has published about uh, 50 peer reviewed papers on one chapter and, and, and of course, many other contributions in different uh, uh, ways. And he has an, an index of uh, 22 coming from, not from ADS in this time, which we are all used to, but inspire HEP for, of course, for the field of research. Today, as you know, uh, as you will know, he will uh, give his colloquium on, on testing black hole structure with very long baseline interferometry so connecting the, uh, uh, the theory of physics of fundamental physics with the observations we are all expecting to have with the new generation even to our successful thank you very much for having accepted uh, our invitation raul and now the floor is yours thank you very much for the very kind introduction and also for the opportunity of being here giving this talk so i'm going first of all to say that this is fine so you can see the slides, if I can do that. Yeah, I'm not sure about it. Let's see. Yeah, now we are starting with the technical problems. <laughs> okay, so. Yeah, I don't know. Wait, uh, yeah? Ah, no, I think. Where so can you can you do that because I don't know. You know, this all happens. Yeah, that's what I was trying to do, but uh, okay. No, yeah, no, you know you can share. Okay, well sorry about that. And uh, so yeah, I'm going to be talking about black holes and the uh, very long baseline interferometry. Um I encourage you to stop me at any point to ask any questions. You know, someone told me after a talk that they have a very nice voice for a podcast to go to sleep, you know. Kind of like, <laughs> so I implies that if I'm talking for 50 minutes, you're going to fall asleep. So yeah, just interrupt me, ask any questions, and yeah, that would be more interesting. So this is the roadmap that we are going to follow. So I'm going to be talking, well, the talk is divided into many parts. The first, the first one, I'm going to be talking about what a black hole is. And, uh, I guess you have an idea for a black hole is. Uh, probably different people in this room will have different definitions of what this means. But I think that this is far from an issue that is settled. And that's what I'm going to be discussing for half of the talk, essentially. And then I'm going to talk about how to, once we know like what black hole is and what are the uncertainties in this definition. I'm going to be talking about how to see or how to distinguish between different definitions using observational data. So I'm going to be starting uh, talking about black holes in classical gravity. So, and this is what a black hole is in classical gravity. So this is going to be a short anatomy class of what a black hole is in classical general relativity. So what we have is uh, so this is a picture of what a black hole would look like. So we have an outer boundary, which is the outer horizon. And then, so the important thing, so the outer part of it will be important later. So for the moment, we just have a horizon. 
which is a one-way membrane, a one-way boundary. So essentially, we can cross this all inwards, we cannot cross it the other way around. And that's what many times is taking us the defining characteristic of a black hole. And we also have a core that I'm going to be talking more about. <laughs> um, so sometimes this is what we, I mean, when we are explaining what a black hole is to uh, general public, this is what we say, that this, this sharp boundary that defines the black hole. I think actually, like, I've, I think this is this can be misleading in some ways, and actually it's better to think about this as a cloud. Because essentially, what happens at the horizon is not that there is nothing happening outside the horizon, then everything happening happens there. There is a region between what we call the photon sphere and the outer horizon when interesting things start to happen. Essentially, what happens is that uh, at the photon sphere, photons are going to follow circular trajectories, closed orbits, and um, if we have, imagine that we are sitting here in these points and we have like a, a torch that we are emitting light, then part of this light is going to start being trapped, it's going to fall into the black hole, okay? And essentially, even if we are pointing in the outwards direction. And that's, that starts to happen in the photosphere, becomes more and more extreme until we hit the horizon, right? So essentially, there is a cloud around the, and this is what the black hole is. Right? All this structure is uh, not just a sharp one. And also in general relativity, we know that there is a singular, so the core is also singular, so there is a problem there. And, uh, and this, is, this provides motivation to analyze extensions of this notion in the theory, in, in, in theories that go beyond general relativity. So just to summarize, these are the defining characteristics of a black hole. So we have uh, a surface where photons <coughs> follow closed orbits, okay. that's the photon sphere. And then there's a region between the photon sphere and the outer horizon where a fraction of photons that we emit when sitting there cannot escape to infinity. So they are trapped by photons, by the one. And then there's a surface where no photons can escape at all, photons at all, this is the horizon. And we also know that there's a singular core inside as well. So this is the, the structure of a black hole in general relativity. Again, let me stress that often all of these this feature here is stressed or it's used for the definition, and then we forget about the other ones. But it's important to keep them in mind, and why is that the case? So the blue features are essential to understand observations. So if we forget about them, then we can, uh, yeah, it makes it more difficult to make contact with observations or to understand what's the interplay between these definitions and extensions of it and observations. So it's important to keep these blue ones in mind for that. Uh, from that perspective, and I'll discuss more about this later. And um, also, uh, the features which are marked in red are important to as motivation to go beyond the theory of general relativity and consider extensions, in particular, to consider black holes in quantum. Yeah. So that's why it's important to keep in mind the whole set of uh, features. Yes. And here's the first question. Thanks. I, I'm, I'm trying nice. to make myself clear between the photon sphere and the horizon. So the photon sphere is is it a, is it like an infinitely small layer where if I launch the photon into the right direction it will be on a closed orbit, right? Yes. Okay, good. Yeah, essentially so the photon the photon sphere, so you can think about it like how many you are trying to measure how many photons you lose if you are emitting you are sitting in one point in space time and you are emitting light. And then you calculate how many photons you lose to the black hole, essentially, because you have a black hole in your space time. So at the photon sphere, you lose essentially one photon that is going to be, it's not that you lose it to the black hole, but you lose it to the gravitational field of the black hole, right? not to the horizon, and then you lose only one. If you go a little bit inside, you're going to lose more and more until eventually you lose all of them where you are at the horizon. So that's the, does it make sense? I mean, I will always lose some. Right. I mean, if point yeah, yeah, of course. But what, what, what I mean is that uh, so you lose some photons that you wouldn't expect if you were in flat space time because they were they are pointing. Of course, if you throw things at the black hole, you you know that you are going to lose them. But if you throw them away from the okay. black hole, okay. yeah, okay. essentially it's like kind of like imagine the black hole is behind me. So I don't, I don't expect any of these photons. Away from the black hole, yeah. it stays in a circular orbit. Yeah, not tangentially, just away in the. Yeah. Yes. So if I may ask, if I understand correctly, the boundary of the photon sphere, or the photon sphere itself, is the surface, uh, the 
first sometimes where I can get close to it. Yes, Is that's that it. Too? Yes, okay. that's true. Right. Yes. Mm -hmm. And when I am thinking about the way from the black, throwing things away from the black, because the black is behind me, and then I expect if I emit rays this way, I don't expect any of this to be to go into the black hole. But as I get closer to the black hole, some of these light rays are going to bend, and they are going to go to the black hole. So I start losing them. Okay. So so yeah, these are the features that we have for a classical black hole, um, and then I'm going to, as I said, so. The fact that we have a singularity, we have a problem in the very definition, invites to consider extensions of, the notion, of this notion. So I'm going to be talking about then uh, what black holes could be in quantum gravity. Okay? That's because we expect quantum gravity to be able to solve this uh, problem of the singularity and give us something that is regular. And in the same way that the previous one was a uh, um, Anatomy class is going to be a clairvoyance class, meaning that we are going to try to predict or to, or to say what we expect quantum gravity to do, because, I mean, we have good indications that could be this way, but we don't really have a picture like this one, like in the classical case. So, uh, we expect that the, the picture we would have in quantum gravity is something like this, in which we have now a regular core, we are solving the problem of the similarity. Um, the features are going, in principle, to stay the same. So we are still going to have a photon sphere. We are still going to have an outer horizon, in principle. Um, the thing is that there is a price to pay, in general, in order to have a regular core, which is we also have an inner horizon. And that's why I was making the distinction between the outer horizon and the inner horizon. So it implies that we have another element in this, uh, in this set of features. So we still have the blue features, the, again, this photon sphere and this region where we trap more and more light. We still have the outer horizon. We have a regular core. So now we solve the problem, or we expect that this problem is going to be solved. And we have a boundary now, which is an inner horizon. And the definitions of outer horizon and inner horizon are similar. So essentially, the outer horizon is an outer surface where no photons can escape from inside. And also the inner horizon is also an inner surface where no photons can escape also from inside. So essentially we have two regions, two boundaries, where that happens. Uh, now the problem with this, well not a problem, but the uh, observation or something that is uh, mm, uh, that's important for the whole picture is that inner horizons are generally kind of stable. And this, uh, so this kind of inner horizon is also, it's not that it appears only for this type of black holes in quantum gravity or extensions of general relativity, but we know them also in the framework of classical general relativity when we consider rotation or we consider charge. And we know in that framework that they are unstable. So they have some features, uh, like essentially the way matter behaves around them makes them unstable. And this is also the case in, in the case of the so We have strong evidence that this is the case. So then this makes, implies that perhaps the structure, the structure is going to change a little bit because if the inner horizon is unstable, then it may be that the system, in order to become stable, is going to get rid of this inner horizon. And the only way to do that is to also get rid of the outer horizon. Essentially, there is a possibility, again, this is just a theoretical possibility, that the system evolves in a way that we get rid of these two features. So they are not going to longer to be there. We are still going to have a regular core, and we are going to have a surface that, again, a photosphere, and this region where things like behaves in that way. Uh, but we may be losing, actually, the defining feature that, as I said before, is like used, or is sometimes the only one that is stressed in the case of classical ones. So of course, this opens the question, if we lose that, that feature, if we lose the horizon, right? The other horizon, then what happens with observations? Are we going to, is this compatible with observations? Are we going to enter in a strong contradiction? It's like, are we kind of like, is the theory perhaps is not making sense? Uh, and the thing is, that's why it's important to keep in mind the blue features, because they are still going to be there in general. And as I said, these are the important, these are essential and give enough freedom to us to maintain compatibility with observations. And that's why it was important to keep this in this from the beginning. So just to kind of to provide a picture of what could be happening, again, this is something that is uh, being, uh, uh, it's 
focus of active research. In particular, in this paper, which I reference here, uh, they say the paper contains a calculation showing that semi-classical effects can give to this uh, distribution. So you can we can we can imagine qualitatively that when we form in gravitational collapse a black hole of this sort, then uh, initially it may have an inner and outer horizon, but dynamical effects are going to imply that the inner horizon is going to move in the out outwards direction until it meets the outer horizon, which is also evolving dynamically. And they may disappear or leave something that is still that doesn't have horizons, but that again still has the photon sphere, because the region is untouched and has a regular. And this is uh, still unclear, but that's the complete picture that is going to be uh, happening theoretical, but it's a possible, it's a possibility, and again it seems to be uh, seems to be evidence, seems to be evidence based on the instability of the universe. But so we need to keep in mind is that the structure of black holes beyond relativity is complex, complicated, and there are still many uncertainties. And ideally, we would like also to see if observations can allow us or can help us in order to be able to distinguish, distinguish this structure. So with this motivation, I'm going to talk about black holes in astronomy, uh, uh, like not in general, but I mean, uh, some particular aspects of this issue. Um, like in this slide, I don't have much to say because I'm going to be talking about this uh, uh, for the rest of the talk. And now this is uh, more like a cooking class because we need to we get some data and we need to be able to, to play with the data and to do something nice with the data in order to understand what's happening inside, right? Because now what we want to do is that okay, we get some data and I want to know what the data is telling me or what's happening inside. Because again, we have also theoretical motivation telling me that there could be many things going on there. And it's non trivial, so I really want to know if the data can tell me what's going on there. And perhaps it can tell me something about the photon sphere, can tell me something about the region in which photons become increasingly more trapped. And we don't know if it's telling us something about horizons or things inside. So that's the open mm -hmm. questions. And I'm going to be talking about this for the rest of the talk. I'm going to use this as motivation and to connect with the rest of the talk. So, this was the first part about the, what black holes are. So, if you have any questions about this, let me know before I move to the next uh, part. And I'll give you a few seconds to take on this. And I'm going to drink some water in the meantime. Yeah, one question. So, what are the time scales or the meaning of the inner and outer? So that's a good question. So we don't know. We don't actually know. It depends on the theoretical models. Because there are theoretical models in which this happens slowly. There are models in which it happens more quickly. And the fact that why we don't know is because we don't have a good control of the dynamics of this evolution. So then we need that in order to understand the times of an open goal in, in, in theoretical research, which is essentially putting together all the ingredients that in fact uh, can have an um, uh, effect on this dynamic and then being able to solve these equations and see the patterns of the kind of thing. So, if I understand right, the horizon may completely disappear. So mm -hmm. we have a photon sphere where photons get trapped, but then inside they can get out again. No. What does it mean that the horizon disappears? So, so in the photon sphere, they get trapped on circular orbits, but once I go further inside, there's a possibility for them to escape again. A fraction of them. A very fraction small of fraction of them. The, the, the deeper you go, essentially, the less fraction of photons can be escape. Okay. Essentially, more. Like an asymptotic thing, or. or yeah. Okay. Yes. I have a question about the uh, instability of the inner horizon, mm -hmm. because I understand that the, in this scenario, the very appearance of the inner pattern is an effect of uh, quantum gravity integrations, mm -hmm. which regularize, regularize the, uh, the singularity. Mm -hmm. But then that means that uh, the instability equations will no longer hold, they are somehow changed. And the result of uh, inner horizon instability is the result of general relativity. Mm -hmm. So, in that sense, don't we also expect that the same quantum gravity effects, whatever they are, who created the inner horizon can also change its stability properties. 
Yeah, that's a good question. And that can be like, the thing is that, so when I say instability, so I'm talking about the an eternal situation, a situation yes, that doesn't yes. has a horizon for. Mm -hmm. uh, but when thinking about dynamical situations, uh, the instability can be seen as kind of like a sensitivity of the position of the inner horizon mm -hmm. with respect to local energy content, energy matter content. Yeah. And then that implies, of course, that's going to depend on the dynamics, but you can do some general arguments saying that if you have some matter that satisfies certain energy conditions, for instance, the inner horizon is going to move towards the interior, and that's what happens in classical general relativity. When we create it, it's in gravitational collapse, it goes quickly to R equal to zero, right, to the origin, and then we have a similar. Right? Yes, but that but, uses yeah. the Einstein equation. Yeah, that's what I mean. So, but if you violate energy conditions, then the inner horizon moves in the outer direction. And that's what you expect like in quantum gravity, for instance, to have to have these contributions. So from that perspective, so the fact that you have modified equations doesn't invalidate the the, the let's say that the statement that the position of the inner horizon is very delicate or very sensitive to having local energy and matter content there, and it's going to move in the outward direction. And of course, like there is there is still uh, you still need to have a good control of equations and being able to really show that that's the case. Was some other question? No. Okay. Well, so I'm going to um, change a little bit or uh, to talk now about the problem. As I was saying, it's like we have theoretical motivation to analyze um, what we can say with data. Uh, and in particular, I'm going to be talking about the observations, uh, BLBI observations, which are a particular kind of observation that we can do. And for that, I'm going to be discussing first a phenomenological model. So we are going to kind of try to parameterize because we have this theoretical uncertainty. So we could always take a particular theoretical model and then see which are the features that we see. Uh, but what I'm going to do here is to do a phenomenological model, which kind of like allow us to parameterize all the possibilities. So this model uh, is going to be constructed as follows. So instead of having a black hole, uh, which we know again, it's, like it's going to be to have to have this boundary and then the region around it in which uh, light has this behavior and has a boundary which you have pure absorptive boundary conditions. We're going to change this by an object that is has a radius which is slightly larger than it. Okay. And it has a behavior which is different. So the boundary can behave in a different way. So instead of absorbing everything, remember that this boundary was absorbing everything in, in the case of black hole. Now we could have absorption, we could have reflection. Some emission, some transmission that we can have light that goes to it. And essentially, this is the most general thing that you can consider. And again, you can change the relative, right? So this is like just being very general, but you can consider this kind of like takes into account many theoretical possibilities. Again, like in terms of these coefficients, a black hole would have gap by equals to one, a black hole, and you can imagine a wormhole, and then that would have different values of the, of the coefficients. You can imagine a pair with a black hole, you can consider a horizon less star, again, a situation with no horizons, as I was discussing before. So, this is essentially a, yeah, a phenomenological model that can describe many different situations. And the question that you can ask now is okay, I'm going to see what observation can, observations can tell me about these coefficients. So, let's see if I can constrain it, or if I can say something about it. And then, once I have this information about the coefficients, I can go, I can say, okay, perhaps. If there is a strong constraint on a particular coefficient, I can uh, conclude that a particular theoretical model in which this coefficient is high or has a particular value is not correct, right? Or is, it requires some changes. So, and I'm going to be working in spherical symmetry. So, just to, so this is, uh, because this is what we were doing in this paper, and that it's referenced there. And of course, it's something that the uh, it's work in progress to generalize this to situations with rotation, which is necessary yeah? in order to compare, to really compare with observation. So this is kind of like a first study of this issue in spherical uh, symmetry. So now with this, so this is the central object, and in order to see, yes. Why do you include emission in the summary? Hmm? Why do you include the emission factor in the summary? Ah, yes, because I've been thinking that there is no intrinsic emission, or I mean, some, uh, like, by emission, I mean, like, I put some, I throw some energy into the object, and then the object emits part of this energy back to me. So it's kind of like energy conservation. Why is it different than the reflection? Is there like a time? Yes. 
so they could be reflection, it's going to be instantaneous, right? Um, it's also going to be, to be I mean, if, uh, it's like a mirror, essentially. It's going to behave in a very particular way. If you throw a ray, you know that it's going to satisfy Snell's law, and then you're going to have certain properties. Well, emission can be, can have like, generally it's going to be in a more in an isotropic way, you know, like essentially it's going to be absorbed, and after a certain time scale, it's going to be re-emitted in a way that is, it, it's not related or correlated with the initial kind of incidence, I don't know if that makes Maybe in a different spectrum? Yeah, certainly they can happen with different spectrum, yes. So this is something that you need to parameterize as well. So, um, this is how we parameterize the object, but uh, we need something else in order to, to see what's, uh, uh, well, uh, to image uh, the object, and it's a, a, an accretion disk. And uh, in particular, I'm going to consider, again, a very simple model, and of course, one needs to consider more complicated models in order to be able to, to understand how astronomical, astrophysical uncertainties affect what I'm going to say. But for the moment, we consider a geometrically thin, an optically thick accretion disk, and that's going to be surrounded in this one. And what we want to know is that if we had a camera there at some, you know, with some angle with respect to the, uh, this axis, and it's far away from the object, so we want to know how we see, how we see this accretion disk and how we see the central object, right? Essentially, because we know that we are going to get rays from the accretion disk and we are going to get this rays. And then also some of the rays, they can go around the object and then we can hit the camera and this gives rise to photon rays. And there could be also some information coming from these boundary conditions if there is reflection here, so we expect uh, to see. So in practice, how this works is that we do some ray tracing from the camera. Essentially, we start uh, integrating rays from the camera to the object. And we follow them and see what they hit, and we apply the necessary boundary, boundary conditions. And, uh, we essentially solve some differential equations, and that tells us how to the image that we see with that camera of this object. Uh, so now this model can be used to test different things. Uh, I, and again, regardless of the theoretical motivation that you have, this is interesting in order to analyze and to understand the information that is encoded in the data. Because imagine, we could do something simple, which is, okay, we don't have, these are many coefficients, I don't care about these coefficients, I just care about, I have something that is, has pure absorption, uh, a boundary like that, like a black hole. But now I want to know my observations, how sensitive are to the radius. So essentially, if I change the radius of this, and I'm going, that's kind of like modifying general relativity, because general relativity have a fixed value of the radius, right? If I change that, can I see that the observations? Imagine I have a, an object which is like one point something times uh, the size. Wow. So that's something that you can ask. Um, essentially, it gives you an idea of how deep your observations can reach in this region that was between the photon sphere and the area, or on the surface of the of the object. Of course, we can also uh, understand. Uh, features which are associated with these coefficients, right? So essentially you can use this model in different ways in order to understand what your data is telling you of these parameters. Uh, so questions about this before I move to the next slide or section. Okay. So, so yeah, that's the, that's the model we are going to be working with. And again, so the motivation is that we have some theoretical uncertainties that we want to parameterize. And uh, so now, I'm going to focus in particular on a, on, on a particular aspect, okay? So it's like from this parameterization, when you do this analysis, there are going to be different things that you can see in images. I'm going to be focusing on a particular one, which is two rings. And the reason is the following. So imagine now that from all these parameters, I take a very simple example, and I take this because it's kind of like simple to think about, which is, I just consider reflection. I don't care about the other coefficients. I just have essentially what I'm doing is I'm, I'm replacing a black hole with a mirror. So I have a spherical mirror, and I'm changing a black hole with a mirror. So that's, that's what I do, okay? It's a big change, because a mirror doesn't behave like a black hole. So it's kind of like the opposite in a way, right? So and what I'm asking is, okay, so how does this look like? So this is a very theoretical exercise, because I'm doing something that, again, we don't expect quantum black holes to behave like mirrors, right? But it's kind of like, it's a very simple thing that I can do, uh, like very abstract, and I want to see what I can learn from this. 
So in this case, what happens is that, uh, for instance, you can see this. Uh, so this is the race. This is what the ray tracing code is doing essentially. So I have the central object, which again did some mirror. So it's going to reflect rays like this one. If you have a ray doing this, it's going to be reflected. And this allocation disk that is emitting rays. And the different colors is essentially it's just a code to keep track of where the rays are coming from initially and where they are the part where they are reflected. Okay. So then it's not particularly important. So what it's important for the purposes of this slide is that imagine you have a photon like this that is emitted this way and then it hits the object here so in the case of a black hole it would be absorbed it would disappear this photon we would never see it apart from the black hole apart from the object, right in this case because it's reflected we are going to eventually see it when we are far away and that's going to give rise to the additional features the images in particular to additional rings which are here so in this image so the two ones this one is what happens when you put the camera here on the axis and look down and this one has some international angle with respect to the axis so essentially that's the difference between these two ones so let's focus on this one here let's see if i have uh, if i do this yeah so so this is the the image of the of the accretion disk this is what i see if i look in from the top right so i see the green photons coming straight to me and the red photons, so, so these are the, again, imaginary looking from the top. And I also see the reflection in the mirror. So this is the reflection of the accretion disk on the mirror. So essentially that's what I, what I see here. What I see in the middle, it's photons that are go around the object and are, and are also reflected. Okay? And I also see photons that can go around the object without being reflected. So it's essentially a combination. So in the, in, so these are the ones, the photons that go around the object do like this without being reflected. We expect them to be there in general relativity. We know they are there and that would give rise to photon rings, which are, which are rings in the image, right? But then in this case, we have additional rings. So because we have reflection, we're going to have additional rings. And uh, essentially we have an additional ring structure that we wouldn't see in general relativity. Okay? So that's essentially what happens when you have a mirror. When you change a black hole uh, with a mirror, you replace it with a mirror, uh, you, you get the features that you see in general relativity, plus some additional rings, plus an inner reflection. That is, again, it was this one here. Huh? Mm -hmm. Yes, this one. Huh? So essentially, so that's something that you can aim for. I mean, if you have data, you can say, OK, let's see if I can see these additional rings if i can place constraints on these additional rings and that way i can place constraints on this reflection okay. um, and pull out this model just for completeness also say that these additional rings also appear if you have transmission so essentially something similar happens if you allow photos to go through this structure then you have something similar okay. that's just for completeness so the main idea is that it's it's interesting to look at additional rings and i'm going to focus now instead of having i mean as you can see you have you have several rings and in practice if you were able to zoom into this image you would see an infinite set of rings again that happens also in gm uh, but we can consider the simplest model in which we have two rings so instead of having just one ring we have two rings and we expect the second ring to be coming from reflection or, or some other process transmission and we want to see if we can see that in yeah. so we can uh, that's the problem we want to analyze. So then we can just do, uh, again, we could take a particular model and uh, analyze the, and, and, and use the particular model, or we can be as general as we want, as general as possible, and consider the problem of having two rings like this one. So I, what I'm proposing now is that I have an image in which, so it, like the image before we had the accretion disk and we had additional rings, right? But I'm going to focus, I'm going to isolate these features. So I just want to analyze two rings because I want to really focus on this uh, to see if, we can, if I can see the difference between one ring and two rings. And the other ones, I consider them to be uh, subliving, essentially. So uh, we can consider an image, which is like this one, in which this is I have two rings, and I have an intensity profile, which is very simple. So there is no intensity here. This would be the image plane. Then there is a step function here, so that I have uh, 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 points here, which are bright. Then I have 
also no, no points with no brightness here. And I also have a step function here. Right? So these are essentially uh, two perfect disks uh, or two perfect rings with a profile which is given by a step function. So that's the function here. So essentially this defines uh, one of the rings, essentially like this one. Uh, this is going to be the diameter of the ring, this is the width. And, uh, yeah, so this gives you the, uh, one of the rings. So the total flux uh, in my image plane is going to be a linear combination of the two of them. So you're going to have one ring here with one diameter and one uh, width, and a second ring with some width and some diameter. Yeah. And that's what I'm proposing to, to, to see, uh, to see what this looks like, or if we can, if we can say, uh, taking a look at the data about this kind of structure. And then, um, <coughs> so again, the main, these are geometric parameters. We have the diameter of the ring, we have the widths, we have the separation between them. And just for uh, being, for the sake of being precise, every time I have an image or some data or some, um, like some plots in this talk, I'm going to be taking these particular parameters, which are the same ones in the paper that it's going to appear soon. So, so yes, I always fix specific parameters. Uh, so now, uh, ideally, what I want to know is how can I see this in the data? So kind of how, how does this look like? Because this is in the image plane, so this is very theoretical still, because even if there are like several jumps, like from, going from a theoretical model to, you know, to now I'm considering a phenomenological model in the image plane with two rings, it's still very theoretical because observations don't give us data in this plane. So I don't get direct the observation, it's not giving me the brightness on one of these pixels. It's giving me something. Right? So I need to discuss that. But the first thing that we're going to do, well, so, and that, that's what I'm going to be discussing next, which is the observability of, of this two ring model. So the first thing that we need to do is to consider the Fourier transform of this. Because that was uh, in the, in the Fourier plane, uh, sorry, in the intensity plane. So where we have this intensity, which is proportional to the flux that I was discussing before. And essentially it's these step functions giving me two rings, okay? I'm going to do uh, a Fourier transform of this image. Uh, there's going to be some observation wavelength here that depends depending on the observation uh, wavelength. And, uh, essentially, that way, I'm going to get a function that depends on two variables, which, uh, yeah, which I will explain uh, the main of it later but, uh, in the next slide. So essentially, I'm going to get, it's just doing the Fourier transform of the function that I had before. And when you do that, in this case, in this very simple case, it's possible to do it analytically. That's why I was considered this particular profile with step functions. Uh, and the result is this one. So essentially, you get a sum, a linear problem. I have two functions for each of the rings. And the function of the two rings, they look the same. So essentially, you have a linear combination of Bessel functions of the first kind, three ones. And then I have the parameters, the outer radius of the, uh, uh, of the ring number one, and the inner radius of the ring number one, and then the same, the outer radius of ring number two, and the inner radius of ring, ring number uh, two. Okay. And uh, this essentially K is just the distance in this UV coordinate. So. And so the important thing to keep in mind is that this is because of these are Bessel functions. So this is going to be something that is going to be oscillating. Okay. So this function here, uh, it's just a linear combination of that. And if I plot it, it's going to be something that oscillates, goes from positive to negative values, and then it has a zeros of some zeros. Okay. So it's going to be vanishing at different points. Of course, the points in which it vanishes, it's going to be depending on this, on this parameter. Okay. If I change the parameters, I change the places where it vanishes. But essentially, I can numerically determine the places where it vanishes for a given set of parameters. So if I fix the model, I fix the rings, the radius, the radius of the, of the, of the ring number one, and ring number two. Uh, and again, inner and outer there, it's the boundaries of the rings. Okay, so this is the inner boundary of the, so inner means, oh, Okay. Yeah, nice. So this inner means this is the inner uh, radius of the outer ring, and this is the outer radius. Ring. So these are the two parameters that I'm using. So uh, that's not the only thing that I have to do. So as I was telling you, that I was going to explain what this EOB coordinates are. And uh, so when I do an observation with a given array uh, of telescopes or radio telescopes, uh, I'm going to have, so 
essentially what I'm getting from the information I'm getting from these telescopes is this function u of u and v evaluated on coordinates which are the difference between two stations. So now imagine they have an array of telescopes and for idealized purposes I'm taking something that is very ideal, so it is not a real array that we have, in which I have a series of radio telescopes forming this, you know, this square. And then what I'm getting, or the information I'm getting, is this V function evaluated. If I take two stations, I have a, this would be the U coordinate and this would be the V coordinate, okay? And this is defined for each pair of stations. So once I have a pair of stations, I get this Uij and Vij, and that's the Fourier component that I'm exploring or that I detected using these stations. And then, like again, for the figures I'm going to show here, I'm just going to be using a particular value. So I'm going to use like a square array like this one, in which I have 20 stations on each side. So it's a lot of stations. And uh, compared to the ones, the real arrays that we have nowadays. And it's going to have certain certain difference, certain maximal uh, scale between the maximum distance between the stations. So, so this is a, yeah. So essentially, just this was a, a way to say that when I have an array, or I'm going to get this information about the Fourier components of this image plane of these two rings uh, uh, structure, um, and of course. I'm going to get it, but I'm also going to get it with noise and errors that I need to take care of, right? I'm not going to get just the, the Fourier transform of it. And essentially these errors, they come in two, in two ways, so they are generally parameterized in two ways. So instead of measuring this, the idea of Vij, I'm going to be measuring something else, Vij hat, in which I have uh, some calibration factors that depends on the two telescopes that I consider. And this essentially it's going to encapsulate like physics, local physics that depends on the on the on each station, like uh, the, the, the elements of the interferometer in each station. Uh, could be also atmospheric turbulence, a series of factors that uh, it's yeah, that we need to take into account. Plus, I will also have thermal noise. Okay. So essentially this quantity, the the the, the, the quantity that I measure, it's affected by errors this way. So in particular, calibration factors. Uh, they are relatively, well, they are complex to measure and complex to determine. So it's, uh, so that motivates defining all the variables in which they don't have as much an effect. Because you can see that the imagine they have a very large calibration factor that I don't know, or it changes very rapidly or very quickly. Then it's going to affect my measure linearly, right? A big change here, it's a big change here. And I don't want that if I don't have these factors under control. Right? So that's what motivates the introduction of closure quantities. Uh, which uh, were, were originally uh, discussed in these papers in the in essentially uh, 60s. Uh, for, and essentially, in this case, what we do is instead of having two stations, like I was defining the Fourier transform just by picking two stations before, now we're going to consider a more complicated geometry in the station, in the space of stations. I'm going to pick four stations and I'm going to Consider so for each pair of stations like this one and this one, I have a Fourier transform here, like Aj. Imagine that this is Ij Kl, right? So I will have Bij. Here I will have Bkl. Uh, well, Vj Bjk. So I will have four Fourier transform components, right? And I can define this quantity. So I take the logarithm of something that I call closure amplitude, and the closure amplitude is two. I have two Fourier transform, two Fourier components here, and two Fourier components here. So that's the quantity that I define. And when you see this equation, it's like, okay, why is this defined this way? So one quick way of motivating that is that if we go back to these errors and I don't have thermal noise, you can see like uh, that the calibration factors, when you put them here, they disappear essentially. So you have four calibration factors here, four calibration factors below, and they cancel. So essentially in the limit of no thermal noise, this quantity is not affected by calibration factors. So they are robust quantities with respect to that. That's why we uh, they, they were introduced. Because now what happens is that of course we have thermal noise and that inverted calibration factors are going to play a role, but the role that they're going to play is that it's going to be suppressed because the changes that they introduce is going to be multiplied by the thermal noise. So essentially now I get some living corrections uh, to these variables. The problem with this is that I make the geometry of the problem more complicated or the data space more complicated because now I don't have just two stations, I have four stations. 
Um, and if I want to plot this, like in the case of the Fourier transform, it was relatively easy to plot because I can plot it as a function of the distance between the stations. But now, if I want to plot this, I naturally have a five-dimensional space to plot this because I want to plot closure quantities in a four-dimensional space, which are my four stations that I'm going to be changed, right? And of course, not all the stations, but you can only form a certain set of quadrangles, independent ones, which are given by this. So these are the numbers of independent quadrangles that we can form. Uh, and yeah, so this is a problem, which is uh, it's a higher dimensional data space that makes more complicated to extract physics from it, okay, as with any higher dimensional uh, data space. So one thing we can do, so we can, we can do a projection. Of it. We can project it along a certain uh, uh, dimension. In particular, I can say, okay, instead of plotting these closure phases as function of a given quadrangle, and then again, this is a four dimensional. Uh, yeah, it would be a five dimensional uh, space interval. Uh, I can plot them as function of the quadrangle perimeter. So I'm just choosing a way to project this. Right? So, uh, so it's kind of in order to be able to have a representation that I can easily see on a screen. And what I get is this. So imagine, and this is now, uh, so all these slides were to show you that how the data of these two rings or one ring would look like if you had actual data. Yeah? So this would be your data port that you would get. From your experiment. So this in this plot here, I plot in two things: blue and red. The blue is a one-ring model, and the red is a two-ring model. Okay? You can see that for the parameters that I have chosen, there is not much difference. But also, there is the issue is even if we are considering only the one-ring model, you can see that the data structure is in this projection is quite messy. I mean, this is kind of nice. Here, right, we can see some structure, and we know where this is coming from because I know that these oscillate and they vanish at some point, and this is a logarithm, right? So I expect to have divergences. So I know, like, okay, I can understand that this happens because this one is vanishing, perhaps, you know, like it's kind of like a, which is what I expect on the basis of the interferometry, like something is going to vanish, and then what I'm seeing is I see a peak, and that's nice. I see a second peak, but then here, Almost like uh, you see, like it's you have some structure, but it's difficult to really disentangle what's going on, and that's not a problem of the data; it's a problem of the projection that I'm doing in order to visualize the data. Okay, so and I'm just choosing this visualization, but it's probably not the best one. So, what can we do? Or can we do something uh, about this in order to, to improve or to to really isolate the features that I want to see? So. We can do something which is instead of considering all the possible quadrangles that we can uh, uh, form, essentially I look at a subset of the data and see if this subset of the data contains the information that we want. Because of course, like all this information, all these points, they have in this data they have information about the whole image. Well, every pixel of the image is going to be encoded uh, here in this case. Right? But I'm not asking for this question because if I'm looking for a one ring. I don't care about the rest of the image, I'm just looking for a particular feature. So it makes sense that if I can isolate part of the data and find a kind of like physically uh, motivated subset of the data, I may be able to, to isolate the feature. So we can do something just uh, now at the theoretical level, which is instead of considering all possible current laws, what I do is I fix three stations and then I only modify one station. So essentially I'm just going to be changing the position of one of the stations. Uh, and then this way, I choose a subset of the data instead of n to the uh, n to the square independent quadrangles, and just keeping essentially n data points. So this is a way smaller subset subset of the data. And what happens there is that if I do this, I can isolate these divergences that I was mentioning before. So hence I would see this for the one-ring model and the two-ring model when I have baselines which are around this value. So essentially, if I take so this baseline can have different values depending on the station that I choose. Uh, imagine that this was again like a very big array with many stations, and I have I consider uh, like these stations here. Like I consider this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, this one. So this is going to be changing the baseline. Right? So if I take this station, if I take this to be three point seventy five giga lambda, then uh, and I have a, a yeah, and I consider stations around this one, this is the plot that I'm going to get. So I'm going to see one divergence with a, towards positive values, one towards negative values, 
and I separate the one remote and the two remote. And this is happening because of what I was saying before in the instructions, essentially the positive divergence is towards positive values, is coming from uh, one of these quantities vanishing, because then we get the logarithm of something that goes to infinity and then goes to infinity. The negative divergence is coming from one of these two vanishing, and then I get the logarithm of zero, so it goes to minus infinity. So that's essentially why I get this structure. Essentially, what I'm doing when fixing three of the stations is that I'm fixing uh, two of these v's, they are constant, and then all the two of them are changing. So this, and then that's why you get ever two types of divergence. So now, this I see one divergence, but this is not enough in order to distinguish between one rings and two rings. Okay? But if I keep, uh, if I keep exploring different baselines, I will keep seeing these divergences. And now it's going to be way cleaner than in the previous plot. In fact, what happens is that if I was able to do a plot like this one, a big plot. I will get one divergence here, then another one here, another one here. That's actually what happens when you consider larger baselines. Yes. If you consider baselines around 8.70 uh, gigalambda and 13.6, uh, this is what happens. Um, so then that would imply that if I was able to access this data, so this subset of the data, I would be able to constrain or to know where these divergences are. Okay. And in fact, I just need to know these three first divergences, so I would have a set of this, like an infinite set of this, in order to be able to distinguish between the one remote and the two remote. So why is that? Because as I said, these divergences, they come because this function vanishes, and if I had a one remodel, which this is not here, I only have two parameters to play with. So these two parameters, they are going to, to completely fix the divergences, the positions of the divergences. So I just need to know three, positions of three divergences in order to be able to falsify this, in order to know if the one ring is everything. Of course, you can see that the baselines are very, uh, they are quite large uh, compared to the baselines that we have available now, but that's all the motivation to consider possible extensions of Kappa for this. So said at the moment, this is a theoretical stuff. Okay, so this is a, uh, the, since the content of the talk, so I'm going to summarize it. So if you have any questions before the, or I can, I can, or perhaps I can just jump into the conclusions, which is kind of like a, it's kind of a summary essentially. So let's to motivate like the physics, when we have physics beyond general relativity, we expect to have uh, additional photon rings, and also we may have different profile for the photon rings, like we can have increased separation between them, increased uh, brightness, uh, there is a series of effects that we didn't have. Now, the question is, if we want to see this in the data, we have to take into account that the natural variables to consider when dealing with noise and to, to get rid of them, or to control the noise, or some natural quantities to do that, which are closure quantities, uh, they complicate the extraction of physics, so specific features, just because of the nonlinear nature. So it's a nonlinear recognition of Fourier transform components. And uh, this, uh, the good thing is there is a trade-off. So we improve the situation with respect to the noise, but we lose interpretability and make the interpretations of the data more complex. So that doesn't mean like with any, that's kind of like from this moment onwards, this is a data analysis problem. So it's not, it doesn't mean that we can do things, it just, we just, it's an invitation to take a look at the data and see if we can isolate certain features like slicing the data, which is what I was discussing. And this can be done if we consider what I'm also with three of the stations can be are kept fixed. And uh, what we can say is that if we want to distinguish for physically motivated uh, models of one ring or two rings, we need quite large baselines. And this could be uh, additional motivation for space based stations, for instance. But again, so this was mostly a theoretically uh, in time study. And uh, of course, this could form the basis for, for future analysis. So, with this, I would like to thank you and also to thank all my collaborators on this slide. Thank you very much. Thank you, Raul. And um, maybe Carlos? Yes, yes, uh, 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 u
And the other thing is, instead of actually dealing with forms, like I understand you want to get rid of dealing with calibration and DMC. That's why you're using so much quantities, but uh, that, that actually is complicating the calculation. Yeah. Uh, when, when you want to fix three stations and move just one station, that would actually require a lot of stations to actually get something. Why not actually deal with the DMC? Yeah, actually, so, uh, so, so as I said, it's like the motivation is theoretical, but one needs to think of possible implementations for this. And actually, when, so one possibility of, uh, in order to have three stations fixed, and one station that is moving, is to have a space based station, and three stations which are on the surface of the Earth. Then you will have a large baseline, and the variation that you need, you actually don't need to change this station, because the rotation of the Earth is going to provide you with an actual variation. So kind of like you can generate a plot like this one. That's why like like this wouldn't be like just the distance, but kind of like a time plot. So time will be this axis, and then kind of like because of the rotation, you would have that. And it's like kind of like a very like uh, just up to it. I'm not saying that this is uh, like uh, the best implementation, but uh, uh, for sure, like there is always the possibility of dealing with calibration factors. So I think that this alternative approach is a different way of and maybe other than just dealing with the, the same frequency, you can just integrate the frequency and then you can start saying all these speed. Uh, mm -hmm. closer to the, the physics and then it's possible. Yeah, uh, but it's like probably you can, I mean, like in the next generation HD, there's going to be a frequency of 330, right? 345. Uh -huh. Okay, yes. So, so it doesn't give you, I mean, it gives you a factor of one point. Right. So it's not going to be such a big effect. So the apps, uh, because I mean, what I mean is that you are limited, but right? you come higher in frequency than you are. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good point. Hi, um, sorry, I may have missed this, uh, but let's say that you are actually observing a, a, a Turin model mm -hmm. and you look at the, uh, the low pressure amplitude uh, of the, uh, the data that you observe. How would you distinguish between a one to model and a two to model based on the position of the divergence? So, so essentially, you would need to be able to. Well, I mean, like one possibility would be here, and uh, I imagine something that you could do is to because I mean, this is the actual difference like, between, of course, not with as many data points as here, so you can imagine you would have less data points, and this actually. You can ask whether or not you can see the difference between these two. Uh, and so I think in general, with the sparse data points in this kind of plot, we're not going to be able to see that. So that's the motivation to consider these uh, these slices. Maybe if you do these slices, the idea is that you can isolate these divergences. Then you will need to isolate three of them in order to classify them. Essentially, because um, these divergences, they, you can you can see them as um, yeah, they are just telling you that. The locations of the zeros, zeros of your function, right? And the zeros are controlled by the parameters of your model. If you parameter, if your model has only one ring, you only have two parameters, so it has to be two parameters to fix all the zeros, so you fix all. So you just need three zeros in order to be able to say, because the two first ones, you can always adjust by choosing the parameters of your model, right? So you can just, if you have two parameters, the first two positions, you can change them. The third one is fixed, and you can really falsify your model by going through two directions. So that's what nice you need. You need to be able to, that's why you need enough, large enough baseline in order to be able to see, to go far enough to see this. Does it answer your question? Yeah. Thank you very much for this talk. Perhaps this is a crazy question. I am wondering if you plan to apply this to ring model to detect the rings, for instance, in the black hole of our galaxy or in a bad galaxy, these are the plans, no? Which can be targeted, the can't identify this. So I mean ideally uh, that would be that, that would be the idea. Yeah. So but the thing is that so with the data that we have uh, right now, because we don't have these baselines uh essentially available, we're not going to be able to see. So if you can conclude is that unless you have baselines of this uh, of this size, then I'm going to be able to use this method in order to see which one of the package.
in the near future could be something to keep in mind so that when we consider extensions and this kind of like that's also part of the motivation of this study it's also the real study but also to see when we consider extensions at the next generation of impact investor like which things are more or less interesting to other investors and then you think about so one thing is the theoretical study and then you see you know, all your theoretical possibilities which you see which things are feasible or not from a practical perspective so i think more about this it's kind of like the extensions to the future Kind of like status to it, and we can do it. Well, and what about if the uh, black holes are dating? But I don't know what the next question is, but I have heard that if the black holes are rotating, you see a region, not a sphere of water. So I guess that the two remote apples, you know, why is the basis of this? We want to do it. Eventually, we have to do it. So, I mean, uh, it's, all the, it's going to be a lot more complex to this new model. So in the sense, in the sense that it's like generally what is going to happen with rotation is that if you are, if it's difficult to see the difference here in the spherical symmetry, like the more parameters and the more physics you need to do, the more difficult it's going to be to this in time of different effects. Right? So that's why we start for this because kind of it's like a very optimistic simple to analyze or something, but it's also like the most difficult, the most optimistic situation. Now, as you, you, of course, you have to improve rotation, you have to improve uncertainties, and you have to increase in this physics, you have to do all this into account. I mean, you have to see how to use in time all these things. That's not true. Oh, that needs to be a lot of things. But it's a kind of test out of the point of knowledge. Okay, so we have a question from the audience. And yes, um, beyond, for instance, imaging and the limitations that you show us about the two ring models to be like a, actually distinguished with the data that we can get in the next, let's say, X years. Are there any other features that we can search for? Like, for instance, this whole thing arises from considering a, a pure reflection object in the middle. Uh, doesn't that provide an additional source of energy and heating water components, such as, for instance, like this? Mm -hmm. So we can expect to see like a change in the temperature or another different profiles that can also complement information in the meanwhile. Uh, how can we search for that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, good question. So that's certainly something that could happen that, that has been analyzed. So what's the interplay of the design and model that I was discussing? The question of this is not changed by the physics is that that's the same one. And the of course, we want to do a model with the two things are coupled. So if you change the nature of the circle object, also you do it this, the lines of the properties and such, right? That's not something that hasn't been analyzed. But also with this model, as you said, I was focusing all day on reflection. Uh, but uh, like man, if you have a mission, uh, then what would happen is that essentially you will have some brightness in the center. Uh, essentially, uh, that's something also that you can test. Right? Essentially, it's the dynamic range, the higher dynamic range that you have, the more constraints you can place on the mission. So it could be a of things. But I, uh, yeah, I just thought about the example of uh, reflection would be more interesting than something like that. Uh, so it's uh, again, so you have. Uh, I mean, also the thing is that reflection is cleaner because you have uh, less uncertainties. If you consider emission, again, we have all these issues of needing to know the spectrum of emission, and you have additional model in the time scales. But eventually, it's something that needs to be analyzed. So I know, I know that I want to do model. Uh, oh, no, 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 and uh, so, is there any additional person? Uh, I understand that you are uh, interested in, in uh, seeing if you can example this in the linear domain. But you could also try making an image out of the data that you're not making and see if you can actually explain the image. Right? So, uh, there's no problem. Yeah, but I'm not sure if uh, the answer is that you could do it also in the image of the fact that you is going to be. Make the procedure to compile. I mean, I don't really know how to compare that. Mm -hmm. So, because you're always introducing something. So, so. But it's true. Okay. You can also do that. Let's see which procedure is optimal. Okay. 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 So, one last question for. Well, yeah, not those things. Uh, no. Thank you. Gracias.
Sí, pero yo tengo una pregunta que es tan tonta que no la puedo poner. 